I think before we, uh, y'all brought some more in, we counted 260-something boxes. I don't know how many more have been added, but that's a yay, God. <clears throat> we'll be able to impact people that we may not meet here, but hopefully somebody may walk up to you and say, you know what, I got your box, and I accepted Jesus because of that. And that would, wouldn't that be so awesome? It's just another way to sow seed for the kingdom of God. I love that, don't you? Oh, thank you. <laughs> How many of you are sleepy this morning? <laughs> are you awake yet? Okay. Yeah. All right, we're going to continue our Q&A we got this week and next week. And one of the reasons that I do this is because I want you to be able to submit questions that, you know, we don't cover everything through the year, and this is a chance for you to uh, submit questions. I cannot get to all of them. There's a couple of them I have studied and I do not have an answer for. And uh, I've, I've listened to some theologians, and they do not have the answer. So I am not a theologian, okay? And uh, one of those questions is, you know, if we're born with sinful nature, how come Jesus didn't have one because he was born of a woman? I've studied that, studied that, studied that. And the best theologian, they say, we just don't know. And you know, the Bible doesn't tell us everything. It tells us what we need to know. And some things we just say, okay, this is bigger than our peanut brains. God's got control of it, and we just have to trust Him. And you know, we, and we have to be, some, some things we just have to be happy with because we just don't have insight into. We can speculate. It's good for discussion. We, d we discuss stuff like this all the time in our, in our men's Bible study. And uh, sometimes we get somewhere and sometimes we don't, do we? <laughs> but we, I mean, it's, it's good for discussion. It's not good for division. You know, it, it's not, there's, there's a lot of things that are not divisive issues. Then there's some that could be. You know, if you don't believe Jesus was God in the flesh, then, then you and I have a problem because... That's, that's what Christianity hangs on. So there's a lot of things that Christianity doesn't hang on. And there's, you know, there's things like the rapture. You know, there's, there's several uh, different views of the rapture. Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, no rapture. Well, you know, good Christians believe all of those different things. And if we, if, you know, you're not mid-trib, then you and I can't fellowship. Well, then we got a wrong attitude. Because so here's the, here's the truth about all that is, if there's a rapture, regardless of when it is, we're all going to go up together. And we can I can point to Terry and say, see, I was right, <laughs> you were wrong. <laughs> but, but you know, there's just some things that, that they're they're of importance, but they're not vital to our faith. Are, are you following me? Okay, today we're going to start with a very difficult verse of Scripture. And uh, this was submitted by one of our ladies in the church. <clears throat> and she says, I ha I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around this verse of Scripture. And we're still going to have a hard time wrapping our head around it when we get done with it, okay? But it's, it's in Luke chapter 14, verse 26. We're reading from the, the New King James Bible. And it says this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. That's a tough verse of Scripture, isn't it? It really is. Hey, do you love, do you love your father and mother? Do you love your wife? Not as much on that one. Do <laughs> you love your children? Sometimes. <laughs> Brothers and sisters? I love my brother and sister. Do you love yourself? You know, the Bible says that we're to love our neighbor as ourself. And then it says that we cannot love ourselves. We're supposed to hate ourselves. So evidently there's something here that we're not, uh, that the, the, tr this, the way that it's translated. So I'm going to read this from the Amplified Bible Classic edition, and it gives us a little insight into it. 
<clears throat> you know, the Greek, the, the Greek language is more, sometimes more expressive than our English language. And it, bas- <clears throat> it basically says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his, his own father and mother in the sense of indifference to or relative disregard for them in comparison with his attitude towards God... And likewise, his wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So, so this gives a little bit different angle to it. The, 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 they go into the Greek and, you know, they, they look at that and what it's kind of talking about. So basically what this is is a comparative thing. And uh, because the Bible doesn't teach us to hate, does it? That's pretty, but 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 they use this language in the in the sense that compared to com, compared to our love for God, our love for our father and mother and wife and children should look like hate. As we're comparing our love for God, you know the the scripture tells us that we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind with all of our strength. That's the greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it. Because, because if, if this was literally true, the way it reads in the King James and New King James, uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't even fulfill this next one and your, as, and your neighbor as yourself. That's the second greatest commandment. So this is not talking about actually hating your father and mother, hating your wife and your children, your brothers and sisters and yourself, <clears throat> this, is ta- this is a comparative thing here. All right, let me ask you a question now. You, you think, whew, compared to your love for God, do you hate your, all of these, your father, your mother, your wife, your children? Don't you love your children? But compared to the love that you have for Jesus, now th- this is a be honest time, Okay. This is not just being religious. Oh, yeah, I love Jesus. Do you really love him so much more than you love your spouse, your children, your parents, your siblings, and even your own self? This is a very troubling verse of Scripture because this, this kind of shows us how much we're supposed to love the Lord. And do we do that? Can we honestly, I mean honest in the, in the honesty of our hearts, can we say that we do that? That's a tough question, isn't it? No, we're not supposed to hate. But the love that we have for God should so much surpass the love that we have for anybody or anything else that it looks like hate in comparison. Maybe we got some stuff to work on, you think? I mean, I've, I mean uh, let's, let's cut this out. Let's cut this out of our Bibles so that we don't have to deal with it. And this is not a condemning thing. This is a heart check thing. Do I have God in the place in my life that he needs to be? But here's a secret. If you love God the way that you should, you're going to love your parents so much better. You're going to love your, uh, your, your spouse and your children and, and your brothers and your sisters and even yourself more than you would if you put yourself first. Because the, the work of God in our hearts, the work of love, because God is love, okay? The work that God does in our hearts is going to be of such capacity that we're going to love greater greater by putting him first than we can by putting him second. But he says, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're really going to follow me, I really have to be first. And, and that's not an egotistic thing on his part. Because it frees us. When we do that, the work in our spirit frees us to be so much more loving than we could be otherwise. Amen? Okay, that's a tough verse. It really is a tough verse. Verse. Second question of the day. Can a born-again believer be demon-possessed? Good question. 
Can a born-again person be demon-possessed? <clears throat> the answer to that question is no. What happens when we get born again? What is it that gets born again? It's our spirit. It's our spirit that had the sin nature, okay? When we get born again, we become a new creature in Christ Jesus. When a person becomes demon-possessed, they become possessed spiritually and mentally, okay? So how can the Spirit of God and the Spirit of the devil possess the same place? It cannot. But I, but I know people who've got, they look like, they act like they're demon-possessed, Christians. You know, you, a, a, a Christian can be demon-obsessed. That's, that, that is where a demon would come in and torment your mind. It's not in your spirit. It's just, it's, a, it's tormenting your mind. You can be oppressed. You know, Acts 10, 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So a Christian can be uh, oppressed in their bodies, I, see, I'm, I'm a firm believer that sickness and disease is an oppression of the enemy. Sickness and disease doesn't come from God. It, it's a, it, it has to do with the fall of man. Uh, it entered in then because man, the way that he was designed by God before the fall, he would have lived forever and never been sick. And when, when he opened the door and he died spiritually, it opened the door for sickness and disease to come in. And it's an oppression of the devil. So, yes, a Christian can be obsessed, he can be uh, oppressed, but a, a, a Christian cannot be demon-possessed. Does that make sense? All right, here's the third question. This is a great question. One of our teenagers submitted this question. And I really, this really came from his heart, and... It asks a very pertinent question. How can we trust God with the souls of the lost? I personally just can't be satisfied with people that I love being lost forever. And I can't imagine how God could and let thousands of lost loved ones die each day. Isn't that a good question? <clears throat> Does it have an easy answer? No, not really. It doesn't really. Can we trust God with the souls of the lost? Well, let's go back and look. When Adam sinned, he was hopelessly lost. What does that mean? There was not anything that he could do to have a relationship with God. Could he have repented? There was no basis for repentance. There was nothing to take care of his sin. He was lost. There was nothing that he could do. He couldn't do better. He couldn't repent. He couldn't apologize. He couldn't, he couldn't do any of those things. He was hopelessly lost as far as where, what he could do in order to be right with God. He could not be right with God at that moment. It wasn't until God came in. He confronted, he confronted the man, he confronted the woman, he, con, he confronted the serpent. He, he passed particular judgments on each of those. And then he took, he took away, you know, they clothed themselves with uh, fig leaves. Which, is, you know, it's kind of a picture of self-righteousness. It's where we try to cover our sin, where we try, we try in our strength to make, things right but there's a problem that when you cut fig leaves guess what they're going to do they're going to die so what did God do he brought skins of animals an animal died so that they could be covered and this is the, the beginning of the sacrificial system and that, that, was the, that was kind of the seed of what was going to happen 4,000 years later when Jesus died on the cross, and, and we don't have time to go into all that. So it, the truth of the matter is that God did something in order that man might be saved. He did something to 
that, that was not a permanent fix from, from the time of the, of the fall until the time of the resurrection. He set up the sacrificial system. He gave the law. He gave all of the, uh, all of the sacrifices that they, they could do in order for their sins to be forgiven. But each time, it was always their choice. The, in the fact, in the Garden of Eden, when he said, of all the trees of the garden you can freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it, lest you die. So he gave him a choice. Mankind has always had a choice. And we choose. We choose our destiny. God does not ravish us. He only woos. Are you listening to me? God does not overpower us, but He's always there. He is always His, uh, through the preaching of the gospel, through the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, if you think back through your life, there was a drawing of God to, that brought you to Christ. You might have, you, you know, you, you may have reaped what you sown, and we have all done that because of the choices that we make in life. They basically shipwreck us to some, to some degree. And we have to come to this point that say, okay, I've messed my life up. I, I need something. And God is always there to say, I'm here. I've provided the way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but me. But by me. He says, I'm here. I'll accept you. I accept you just like you are. And I will, I will cleanse you and I will forgive you because I Love you. So can we trust God with this thing of salvation? Listen, God loved the world so much that he did what? He did something that we would never do. Let me ask you a question. Would you sacrifice one of your sons for somebody who hated you? Would you do that? And you say, well, I might. Well, which one would you sacrifice? He sent His only Son, only begotten Son, to die for us, knowing that many would never accept Him. Now, I'm, not, I'm not trying to get into Calvinism and Arminianism and Universalism. You know, that, that, those, are, those are issues that we could talk about that could add different insight to this, but, but I'm not going to do that. Because no matter... When we come to God, we have to come through Jesus. No matter what you're, if you're a universalist or you're an Ar Ar Arminian or you're a Calvinist, we all come through the blood of Jesus. That, that's, that's how we all come. So, God is invested in our salvation. God loves us and God is going to do everything that he can to get us all in. but he's not going to overwhelm us. He's not, you know, if you, if you want somebody to love a, a female, let's say, you know, you don't ravage a female, you woo. We call ravaging rape, okay? God doesn't rape us. He draws us. He courts us. He woos us. And just because one of your loved ones is resisting right now doesn't mean that they will always resist. This is where our part, it's where our part is to love, to, to sow into. Not, you don't have to just preach and, hound, you, you know, you don't hound people into the kingdom. You love people into the kingdom. And it's, it's difficult sometimes. Okay, so... We can trust God with the lost. And God cares more about your loved one than you do. Now, now let's go to our responsibility. Do we care about the lost? How much do we care about the lost? And what is the last thing that Jesus said before he ascended? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He, he, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, and he who believes not shall be damned. In Matthew, he said, go into all nations and make disciples. Our job 
is to sow into people. Our job is to help people learn. Our, 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 our job is to point people towards the Savior. We, we need to know the plan of salvation, and we need to be sharing that with people who are open to hearing it. We're, we're seed sowers. We're seed sowers, and that's what we should be doing. And, uh, you know, you may not be able to reach your loved one, but you can pray that God would send somebody into their lives that can, that can reach them. You know, uh, sometimes th things in families get fractured a little bit. And, uh, you know, especially when you're raising children, you know, you know, when they get to be about 13, 14, they think parents are crazy. They don't know nothing, and that you know they. Are, oh, I know. And you may not be the one that can reach that person, but you can pray that God would send a laborer across their path that could sow into them and have have a relationship with them. And and this this I learned. I, my kids thought I was, I was too strict. I was this and I was that, and uh, we kind of stood our ground and loved and. They argued with us some, but all of them today are serving Christ. And uh, we didn't lose our children. And uh, so never give up. Never, 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 ever, ever. Because, listen, God never gives up. He never, never, ever gives up. And I think it, I think it grieves his heart when people die without Christ. It, you know, it, it, he said, I gave my son for you. What else can I do? Amen. Okay, I hope that I hope that helps. It does, you know, it doesn't answer all of it, but it, we need to see from, from God's perspective that He He is not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. And I hope all do. I hope all do. <laughs> okay, here's a, here's a good one. <clears throat> My sister isn't a Christian. This is this is such a common issue right here. This is why I wanted to include this one. My sister isn't a Christian, but thinks since God is a loving God and she's a good person, she will go to heaven. I've tried to answer her, but it hasn't been well received. How would you answer that? That is one of the, the greatest deceptions in our culture today. If I be good, then I'm okay. If I just be good... If I treat people the way that I want to be treated, then I will be good. I want to share with you what is commonly known as the Roman road to salvation. And this is a good way that you can deal. You, know, it, you don't have to quote this at people, or you can. I have used this and brought several people to Christ. This is what we call the Roman road to salvation. Romans 3.23 says this. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. How many have sinned? All have sinned. So then the Bible goes on to tell us in Romans 3, 10, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no one who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have... Together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. So now are you an exception? I'm a good person. No, that's not what God said. He says there is no one who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, probably not one person is guilty of all of these, but we all can find ourselves somewhere in this list. I know we've all used our tongues in bad ways. And I'm not just talking about cursing. I'm talking about using them to damage other people. We've, we've used them. Romans 6.23 says this. For the wages of sin is death. If you have ever sinned, the wages of sin is death. 
Anybody who has ever sinned deserves death. But thank God for the second part of this verse. But the gift of God. Now notice this. Gift of God. Gift of God. Do you earn a gift? A gift is something that's given. The gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So the gift points towards a person. It points towards Jesus Christ. It doesn't point toward you. It doesn't point toward your goodness. Because you have no goodness to offer God. They say, well, I know good people. Well, we're comparing ourselves among ourselves. We're comparing ourselves by ourselves. See, if you, if, you know, if, if it's goodness, there is a scale of goodness. How do you, I mean, where is the cutoff line? I mean, you're good up to this point, but you do this one thing and you're over the goodness line, so therefore you, you're lost. Well, where is the goodness line? I mean, you know, that, that's just, there's just so much stuff there that, that it's not even feasible. So God did not put it on a goodness scale. There are going to be people in heaven that haven't been that good. Some of you may be sitting here today. That you're, I mean, if we did this thing right here that, you know, here's your bad stuff and here's your good stuff, and if, if the bad stuff outweighs the good stuff, then, then you're in trouble. You'd be in trouble. Because many of you have spent years and years and years doing bad things. Thank God it's not on goodness and badness. Thank God there's not a scale. It's, it's a gift. A gift of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 5.8 says this. But God demonstrates His own love toward us. I like this. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. When did he die for us? While we were still sinners. Not while we were working our way up the ladder. No, while we were still sinners. While you were cursing God. No, he died for us before the foundation of the world. He's the, he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. See, God saw that when he gave man free will, what he would do. And he says, okay, I'm going to cover that. I'm going to cover that. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have to accept Christ. That doesn't mean that all consequences of our choices still don't haunt us. You know what? If you got, if you got pregnant out of wedlock, which is a sin... When you repent, does the baby go away? No, you have that baby. You got responsibility towards a baby. Okay? You know, if you got divorced uh, before you came to Christ, does the consequences of that go away? No, it doesn't go away because there's divorce is a horrible thing. There are consequences. People are hurt and damaged, and and yeah, we have to deal with those consequences. But listen. God forgives that. Just because God forgives something doesn't mean that He changes it in, in the natural. It just means that you're not accountable for it in eternity. And, there, you know, there's a, there's a big thing there. I'm preaching good today. I don't know if you know that or not. <clears throat> then Romans 10, 9, and 10 is the thing that, that brings us into this faith. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus or Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that you have been a good person, no, that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, what, when we say that we believe that he's been raised from the dead, we also believe that he died for our sins, that he suffered for our sins, and that he was raised from the dead for our justification. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. How do we, how do we become righteous? We believe. It's a thing of faith. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So can I be good enough? If I, if I just live my life and a good person, can I go to heaven based on that? No. There's a lot of good people 
who will die without Christ because they thought that just being good is enough. It's not enough. It won't work. It won't work. Amen. Here's another tough one. I've got time for this one. The Bible says to honor your father and mother, but what if the relationship is so toxic that you have to distance yourself from, from one or both of them to have peace? What is the parent's responsibility in this? This is a hard question because the, the Bible doesn't really qualify honoring father and mother. I was fortunate that I did not have perfect parents, but I had good parents. And I, didn't, I did not always honor my, my father and mother when I was young. I did honor my father and mother as, as I became a Christian and understood that. And, but, I, but I do know that there are, like you say, there are toxic situations where you really, it's hard to be in a relationship with them. And uh, there's a fine line that you really have to walk. You, you can't dishonor parents. I mean, you have to be real caref careful that you don't dishonor. Even though that you can't really be in a relationship because it's so toxic, doesn't mean that you can't, that you just dishonor them. You honor them in any way that you can. But you can't, uh, you know, I, and I'm thinking of different situations where parents were abusive. Well, you can't honor that. But at the same time, you, you, uh, you can't sow the seeds of dishonor that would come back and cause your children not to honor you. Does that make sense? Uh, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a hard line to walk. And, uh, the be, you know, the best thing that you do, if you're in that kind of situation, you make sure that you're, because parents have a responsibility, they do have a responsibility in this to live, to live their lives in a, in a particular way and to raise their children a particular way. We need to raise our children to honor not only the parents, but to honor everybody. But that doesn't mean that you can be in relationship with everybody because it would be, it would be bad, it would be bad for for you to be in a relationship with with dysfunctional people, and that's hard to do. And I, I don't know that I gave a good answer to that, but the parents do have a responsibility to set the culture of the family, and this is this is where we as parents we need to do that. We need to set the culture. One of the things that my, my mom and dad did is they set the culture. My dad was a great provider for our family. He loved us. He didn't tell us he loved us, but he loved us. He demonstrated it in the way that he provided for us. But it was my mother who set the culture of the family. Oh, my gosh. She, uh, she, made, she made things special. She loved us unconditionally. She loved us and... and uh, Spiritually, she spoke to us spiritually to the degree that she understood certain things, but she made birthdays uh, wonderful, uh, holidays wonderful. We, we still, I tell you, I, uh, Thanksgiving is our favorite holiday. We always went to mom and dad's. We're going to miss that. She's gone. And uh, but she always made those days special. She made it special with the kids, and our and her grandkids and great grandkids loved her because she made it special. It it was easy to honor her, and 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 I know that some of you don't have that in your life, but you just got to do the best that you can to not dishonor. Does that make sense? That's as good as answer as I can give to that. All right, let's do one more. I'm going to save this evil question until next week. That's <laughs> okay, we know God has our lives planned out for us. Nothing is a surprise. So why pray for something to change if God has it all planned? Well, 
God is all-knowing. He knows everything. There's nothing that God does not know. God has a plan for our lives, but I don't know that He dictates every detail of our life. God knows the choices that you will make, good and bad, but He doesn't control the choices that we make, good and bad. But let's say that he did make our choices and we sin. Why would we, would we still repent if he caused us to sin? I don't think so. What, I mean, if he caused it, why would, we need to, why would we need to go against his plan and his will and say, I'm sorry for something that he planned? So I think that in general, God has a plan for our lives. And, and he has given us the option of how we follow that. He knows. <laughs> he knows that we will fail in many of those things. And the good thing is that he makes a provision for us to recover from those things. And one of the ways that we do that is through prayer, through repentance, through submission, through all of those things. Because he knows, the bad, he knows the bad decisions that I made. He knows the ones that I will make. And I can rest assured that he has the solution for the problem that I created, but yet it doesn't change his plan. God is bigger than our failures. God is bigger than our sin. And God saw it and he made a provision for us. We just need to be willing to... To say, okay, I did this, Lord, I'm sorry. And I don't know that every event is planned out specifically. I think they're, they're, we always have a choice. We always have a choice. And it's, it, it, it's very difficult to reconcile sovereign God and free will of man. And I don't know that infinite uh, a finite mind can wrap its, around, wrap its mind around an infinite God who, who will never lose control over any situation. Does that, does that make sense? That's a hard question. It is a hard question. But ju just know this. We, we, God told us to pray. God told us to ask. And there were times in the Bible... That, that he told particular people, set your house in order because you're going to die. He turns, his, he turns his face to the wall, prays, and God adds ten more years to his life. Well, did God change his mind? Not necessarily because he knew that when he told him that, that what he was going to do, and he already knew what he was going to do. Now, what if he hadn't turned his face to the wall? God would have known that and he would have died. I mean, you're not going to outmaneuver God. Isn't that good? Yeah. We're not going to outmaneuver God. Amen. Okay. Let's quit right there while I'm a even. <laughs> I don't know if I'm ahead, but I'm even. See, y'all have asked some very difficult questions. Wait till next week. <sighs> then I'm going to do, I'm going to try to finish up with some what I call popcorn answers to, to uh, not as difficult questions, and I'm not going to get to all of them. I, but I kind of picked the, the ones that I thought that would speak to us the best, okay? Are we good with that? All right. We'll try to do this every year so that you can ask questions. Let's stand together. Prayer team, would you come? If you need prayer today, they're here for you. If you, if you need to get saved today, come get saved. Amen.